Well, listening to the um, second half of uh, Luigi's remarks there, when he was talking about the fact that Etno is not um, seeking any new regulatory system and is supporting a multi-stakeholder um, uh, policy-making uh, uh, forums and is uh, seeking to create a, a future-proof framework for innovation and new services, I, I thought maybe we're sitting next to each other and I thought maybe our pages had gotten uh, mixed up here and that somehow he had taken a couple of sheets of my speech because um, those were exactly the points that I was going to be making here. But in fact, I will explain to you tonight, if I can, why I think his proposal uh, would not have the effect that he describes and why I think it um, is not uh, good for the future of the internet. Although I don't want to dwell too much on the Etno proposal because there are many other important proposals for uh, the wicket which all of the people in this room should be concerned about. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Thank you and thank you to uh, EIF for putting this uh, event together and to my, my fellow panelists. Everybody in this room knows there is a global struggle underway for the future of the internet. Over the past 20 years, we've seen this technology grow at an unprecedented rate, supporting economic activity, human development, and democratization. This did not happen by magic. The Internet's growth was facilitated by a policy framework, conscious choices made, based on competition, non-discrimination, voluntary standards, peering, openness, and protection of human rights. That framework was developed in different forums, including governmental bodies, but also uniquely in multi-stakeholder venues and uniquely through voluntary arrangements. That policy framework supported innovation and it produced the enormous benefits that we see in terms of accessibility and affordability. Europe was a leader in the development of that policy framework. And while there are differences in some respects, between the US and Europe, we have been in agreement on both sides of the Atlantic on the essential elements of that enabling framework. But that policy framework is not universally accepted. There are some countries in the world that take a very different view of the internet. You may have seen the comments of the Estonian president in June, and he put it quite bluntly. He said, quote, like it or not, we are now entered a new period of struggle between competing systems of government and economic organization. What is at stake in this struggle is the liberal democratic model of an open society and market economies that are transparent and rule-based. This time, the president of Estonia said, this time the struggle will play itself out in cyberspace. <clears throat> and we are seeing that struggle play out now at the ITU as it considers amendments to the ITRs, the International uh, Telecommunication Regulations. Now the debate about internet governance should not be conducted on the basis of criticizing, let alone demonizing the ITU. We should put aside uh, statements about the ITU taking over the internet. That's not the appropriate frame here. No one is arguing that the ITU should have no role at all in internet governance. Indeed, the ITU is already involved in internet governance, developing best practices through its study groups and through ITUD. Nor is it necessary in this debate to claim that all is well in internet governance. To the contrary, there are clearly challenges, cybersecurity, the continuing digital divide, intellectual property enforcement, the very hard questions posed by uh, content such as the offensive video that has uh, sparked riots in the Arab countries uh, in the past week, and so on. Rather, the debate is over a very specific tool of the ITU, and that is the ITRs. The debate is whether the ITU should play its role in internet governance through a binding treaty, the ITRs. 
the internet grew up with many focal points for governance. Some of it was centralized but private, large uh, ICANN, for example. Some of it governmental but national, a cybercrime. But uniquely among transborder activities, as I said, the internet has evolved through voluntary standards and private to private peering relationships. When we think about the problems facing the internet, these challenges, particularly the challenges of the developing world, where the next billion will come from, we must look at the problems, we must ask what are the existing institutions working on them, and what are the best ways to either support or replace those institutions if we think they are not effective. But when you consider what are the problems, what are the institutions working on them, and what are they doing, you must conclude, I believe, that the ITRs, the treaty, is not the instrument through which to address internet governance challenges. Take domain names, already being addressed by ICANN. Now, ICANN is everybody's favorite punching bag, but does anybody really believe that the ITU could do better? No. And the Secretary General uh, Touré has said that he has no intention and ITU has no intention to take over the domain name system. However, when you look at the proposals to the wicket, there are lots of references to addressing in those proposals, which should give you pause. Internet standards, including security standards. There's no need to usurp or supplant the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, ISO, the IEEE, these are working well. They're open. They're participatory to anybody. They're producing voluntary standards that work as proven in the marketplace. And yet there are references in the wicket proposals to making standards mandatory. Cybercrime enforcement. The Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty, while it's not perfect, provides a workable framework. Cybercrime and cybersecurity get directly into questions of government surveillance, information sharing, privacy, control over information flows. The COE, with its origins as a human rights organization, is better suited to address those problems than the ITU is, and yet the word security and information security and other concepts appear throughout the proposals put forth. And where are those proposals coming from? Security proposals, for example. From Russia and the CIS, from the Arab states, from the very governments that feel threatened by the internet and that have this different vision of what the internet uh, should look like and how it should function and its role should play in the development of uh, society. And they're looking for those few little word changes that they can use to ratify or justify their alternative vision of the internet. So in terms of the ETNO proposal, uh, ETNO argues that it is not seeking to regulate but only to promote contract negotiations. But it is choosing to try to promote contract negotiations through a binding treaty. And once we plant the seed that governments have some role in facilitating these negotiations, are they really negotiations? Now, I'm not here to suggest what the EU should do about the ETNO proposal. Many of you already know it will entrench incumbents, not only the telcos, but the, the big over-the-top players. Google will pay. Google will pay the fee. Uh, sender uh, a part paying party. The question is what about the other uh, uh, competitors? What about the innovators? What about the efforts of Europe to build its own strength in the cloud, in social networking, social media, and other innovative services? <coughs> From my perspective, the ETNO proposal will lead to fragmentation. As I said, Google will pay. They'll pay to deliver to France or to Germany. Will they pay to deliver to Romania or Bulgaria? Maybe not. Yes, they'll deliver their content to Estonia, but maybe not to Lithuania. You will decide whether the proposal is consistent with the acquis. But you must also consider its broader 
implications. The Etno proposal will impose greater burdens on development in the very countries that need it most, the countries of Africa and South America, Asia. It will entrench the incumbent telcos not only in Europe, but in South America, Africa, Asia. And it will, as I said, entrench the established content providers, the startups in Africa. This is where the development is occurring in the build out of broadband. In 2014, three underseas cables will open up between a South America and Africa. Major development completely bypassing that old pattern where all the traffic passed through the United States. That's long since passed. It's now going through Europe. That will be surpassed by the development under the current system of the local capacity and of the international capacity. And yet Etno is using the language, and this is what I think is so dangerous, using the language of development for a proposal that if adopted would actually um, harm development in the countries that most uh, need it. So of course there are challenges of internet governance. And we need to be especially sensitive to the concerns of those countries that feel they are being left behind. We need to continue to strive to make internet policy making more open and transparent and participatory. But to draw again on the themes used by the Estonian president in his comments, he said, quote, between the US, the EU, and like-minded nations at one end of the spectrum, and the authoritarian countries at the other extreme, a large number of countries sit on the fence on the issue of the future architecture of the internet. They have legitimate concerns about internet governance, so we must focus attention on their needs. Close quote. But in addressing those needs and responding to those concerns, we have two choices. We can reconsolidate the powers of governments and incumbents, or we can work with the principles that have built the internet to date, that have resulted in this remarkable, remarkable uh, development. Engagement with civil society, democratic values, the human rights principles that have helped shape this technology, innovation without permission, decentralization, the voluntary standards developed through open multi-stakeholder processes. I think the challenge is for people in this room to work together through your national delegations, to our national delegation, and through the national delegations of those countries that sit on the fence in the middle that are wondering which way to go between the, the, the model that Europe led the way on versus what I call the China counter model. Countries sitting on the fence wondering which way to go. That's what's at stake in the wicket. And that's why we need to stick with the policy framework that has worked so far that I believe is future-proof and will work for the future. Thank you.